Today, CG industries like game development and VFX for movies and TV shows are pretty much dominated by three major 3D packages, which are Maya, 3ds Max, and Houdini. But if you take a look around you, you will realize that there are a lot of cool 3D software like Blender, Moto, and other 3D software that are no longer with us like Softibash, or 3D software that fell from a scene such as Lightwave 3D. So what are the reasons behind some 3D software being widely used in the industry and others not so much? And let me tell you, it's not just about how good the software is, so stick around because this is gonna be interesting. In the early days of computer graphics, having a 3D software that can make video games and visual effects was something very special. You see, 3D software such as Max, Lightwave, and Houdini were very hard to develop back in the day, and they were very expensive. For example, at some point, Houdini could set you back $17,000 per license. Regardless, VFX and game development studios were ready to pay the price because, to be frank, these were pretty much all the options that artists had back in the day. This means that whichever the first software was to collect the biggest user base of artists and studios had a stronghold on the market for decades to come, but of course under some conditions. For example, a 3D software can't get by for decades without being developed with new tools and features, also updated to meet the needs of 3D artists. But some 3D software just don't cope with the progress and needs of the CG industry. And this is what we have seen with software such as Lightwave 3D, which is now just a shell of its former self in terms of popularity. Lightwave 3D played a significant role in the VFX industry, especially during the 1990s and the early 2000s. Its appeal largely stemmed from its affordability, in addition to its capabilities and the unique division between its modeling and animation but now it is not that popular and it suffers from lack of development and negligence to a certain extent. The most recent release was in 2020, but hopefully there is gonna be a new upgrade, a new release in late 2023. When you look at it back in the day, it was used on great and very successful movies like the Titanic in 1997, 300 in 2006, and even Iron Man in 2008 and successful TV shows like Babylon 5, Star Trek Voyager, Battlestar Galactica, and more. But that was more than 15 years ago. And if you know anything about creative fields such as digital art, like game development and VFX, you should know that the technology is moving too fast. Over the years, other 3D software like Maya, Max, Houdini, and Cinema 4D have undergone rapid development introducing innovative features and streamlined workflows. These packages offered robust capabilities that appealed to studios and individual artists alike. If you were a Lightwave 3D user back in the early 2000s, you would never think this would happen and you will never believe that this 3D software will be forgotten, but it did unfortunately. Also, one thing that keeps software such as Max, Maya and Houdini on top is the fact that it is very hard to switch software and production pipelines. Generally speaking, it is known that it is hard to change software and production pipelines along the way. But if a 3D software or any other software does not keep up with the needs of artists and productions, it will be left in the dust. I mean, it will happen over the years, of course. But on the other hand, if it meets their demands and helps ship projects successfully, they will be extremely hesitant to switch to a different 3D package. Take for example Blender, it is great, it is free, and it is awesome, but it is not widely adopted in the industry. First of all because change is extremely hard, but there is another reason which is technical support, and this is something that we're gonna talk about later. But to a certain extent, I think it is not as influential as the next reason. One of the important factors that decides which 3D software to stay in the industry and which one to become history is who's behind it. Giant companies such as Autodesk, Adobe, Cytofax, Maxon, and so on play a huge role in this regard. Things like acquisitions, discontinuation, or merging of 3D software products by major companies like Autodesk can have profound implications on the landscape of industries like game development, VFX, advertising, and so on, and they will affect the tools available for professionals and studios. 
The fate of products like Softimage, Max, and Maya under Autodesk serve as an interesting case study. When Autodesk acquired both 3ds Max from Discrete Logic Company and Maya from Alias Wavefront, it effectively took ownership of two of the leading 3D graphics and animation tools in the industry. The acquisition of such major tools granted Autodesk significant influence over the 3D design and animation market. However, with the discontinuation of Softimage, which was a great software in VFX, game development, and the animation community, Autodesk made a strategic decision. Softimage had a dedicated user base, and its termination meant that those users had to either migrate to other Autodesk products or seek alternatives outside of Autodesk. Unfortunately, Autodesk had a monopoly, and they still do by the way, which can be a negative thing unless Autodesk keeps developing their 3D tools to meet the demands of 3D artists. The point I wanted to make is, a giant company like Autodesk has the power to decide which 3D software to live and which one dies. But there is even a deeper layer that help Autodesk engrave their products in the minds of the next generations to come. Here is the interesting thing. Autodesk's strategy of offering software like Max and Maya to students and they do this for free, is considered a clever approach to foster brand loyalty and embed their products deep within the industry's fabric. And they do what is called educational seeding, where you introduce users to a tool at an early stage in their learning process in hopes they will continue to use it as they progress in their careers, which is smart. By providing students with free access to 3ds Max and Maya, Autodesk ensures that the next generation of VFX artists, game developers, and 3D modelers in general become familiar with their software from the outset. As these students undergo training and build their portfolios, they naturally lean into the tools they knew best and those they had access to during their formative learning years. So as you might have expected, over time, this continuous flow of new professionals entering the industry with proficiency in Autodesk software reinforces the software dominance. Naturally, of course. And here is the funny thing. As schools aim to provide relevant training, they will often structure their curriculums around the most popular and widely used tools in the industry, knowing that a significant portion of the industry uses Autodesk products. These institutions will be more inclined to teach Max, Maya, and other Autodesk tools. This again creates a feedback loop. This means that students learn Autodesk software, they go to the industry to use it, and as more professionals use these tools, schools will have to teach these tools, and the cycle goes on. There is something else I want to talk about. Some 3D software developers don't listen to the needs of artists, or they make changes in the wrong direction just like what happened to Moto. In the early days, Moto quickly made its mark in the 3D industry, especially for its prowess in modeling. Over a relatively short period of time, it gained traction and was recognized as industry standard, especially for modeling. But I think where Moto made its fatal mistake and error in judgment was when they began expanding its suite of tools to cover areas beyond just modeling such as animation, simulation, and rendering. The intention was likely to offer a more comprehensive 3D package similar to software like Max and Maya. The only problem was that this expansion presented challenges. As Mono ventured into areas where other software packages had already established dominance, which is a key point, and this has been more than a decade for its competitors, which meant it faced stiff competition. From what I have seen, Moto was celebrated for its modeling capabilities, and the new tools after the expansion weren't met with the same level of enthusiasm. Some users felt that this was a quest to be a jack of all trades, and Moto might have spread itself too thin, instead of being a master in modeling. It now risks being seen as adequate in many areas, but not truly really excelling in any particular one. In the highly competitive VFX and game development industries, where efficiency and specialization often matters, studios typically gravitate towards tools that can offer the best results for specific tasks. For instance, while Mono's animation tools were competent, they couldn't quite rival the deep-rooted ecosystems of software such as Maya. Similarly, when it comes to simulation, software such as Houdini held a significant edge. But the next bunch of 3D software did not make the same mistakes like Moto, 
As a result, they did not suffer the same fate, because they target a certain type of artist and they aim to help them do one particular task really well. For example, if you look at ZBrush, it was a 3D modeling software more than 15 years ago, and it is still a 3D sculpting software today. That's why it is the most important 3D software for this type of work in the industry. In fact, it is so good, it has no competitors. Other specialized software include 3D texture painting software such as Substance Painter and Mari. Substance being a go-to 3D software in game development, and Mari the go-to texturing software in VFX projects, which makes sense, looking at their features and tools. But they can be used interchangeably nonetheless. However, these software aren't 3D packages that can cover all the production pipelines. So if they get lazy, studios and artists can use the best next alternative. After we talked about all these things, I have to mention that sometimes a few things can deter studios, especially from adopting a 3D software such as Blender, even though it is completely free to be used commercially and has amazing tools. This is due to a simple fact, which is the fact that it does not have technical support. I mean official one from the Blender Foundation. This makes it very popular among 3D artists, beginners and professionals alike, but not among big studios around the world, at least for now. We are seeing some progress in the industry using Blender, and year after year, we are seeing major projects created using it. But it is not industry standard yet, and I hope there will be official support to help more studios adopt it further in the industry because it is such a fantastic tool. So there you have it guys. I hope you found this video useful and informative, if you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.